Hello and welcome to Fizz Free. It's episode 10. I'm Jane. And myself and Ruth are calling this one the Sober Timeline. Taking a look at the benefits that really build every single day that you don't have alcohol in your life. These can be physical and emotional benefits and we don't even touch on the financial to be honest. But documenting the days, the weeks and the months that pass as those cumulative benefits just keep stacking up of an alcohol-free lifestyle. Thanks for listening today. It's Fizz Free. Hello. Recently I heard a smoking cessation advert and what jumped out and struck me was the positivity of it. I thought, how amazing. This advert is telling you that within six hours of stopping smoking, you'll experience these benefits. Within 12 hours, those benefits. And within two to three days and seven days, X, Y and Z. And it was only a relatively short advert on the radio, but I thought... Oh, how nice not to hear doom and gloom. I don't respond well, and I never did in my drinking career, to having the dangers pointed out to me. No, thank you very much. You can stick those. I don't want to hear the negative effect of alcohol. I can find them very easily. They seem to be everywhere. La, 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 head in the sand. So I was never one that responded too well to the scaremongering tactic. And I don't think that I'm alone in that, Ruth, whereas I know that you really enjoy being able to take hold of the facts and the details and the black and white and use that as um, motivational proof to be able to see that, you know, alcohol causes, for example, seven types of cancer. You know, it can go either way. But what really struck me about this smoking cessation advert was the positives. And I thought, do you know what? That would be a nice one to consider with alcohol, especially if you're battling through day six, for example, and things are feeling a bit wobbly and a bit tough. It can be worth just thinking of the benefits. And in fact, Ruth, you and I have been through pregnancy. Do you remember looking in your pregnancy book like at 12 weeks, the fetus will have developed X, Y and Z is now the size of an avocado, that kind of thing, if you remember that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I used to love that because it's so descriptive and sort of paints that lovely picture and you can imagine what's going on inside your body. And, you know, if you've got all that information for smoking, it, you can really imagine your lungs healing and I mean I've never been a smoker but in terms of drinking I remember looking at the positives and how my body was changing for the better and I remember thinking my liver must be all snug and kind of with a big smile on its face thinking I haven't got any work to do today I can just have a little lie down because no toxins are coming in here yeah (laughs) do you know what I've lost no weight since giving up drinking a year and a half ago but I always tell myself and I put this on my Instagram page I just think my liver must be absolutely gorgeous if you could do a before and after of my liver I know that you'd see massive improvements. I just don't have um, a side-by-side of my body on the outside (laughs) to show that benefit. But anyway, it was that I wanted to look at. I'm a really positive person, and that really appealed to me. Let's say you've been having heavy drinks on a Saturday night. Let's say that's a a night of drinking. Everybody's timeline is different, but there is a general pattern that is followed with the side effect. Okay, so the 6 to 24 hours after your last drink, let's call that Sunday, you've got your withdrawal symptoms, your headaches, tremors, nausea, sweating, potentially. Uh, symptoms can start mild and then get worse. We know how this can feel, even vomiting late in the afternoon and difficulty keeping food down and that general awful classic hangover feeling. Taking you through to 36 to 72 hours after your last drink. So here you're looking at the Monday, Tuesday. And although you'd like to think things are getting better, I think this is what feels like a punch in the face for a lot of people, that that's when the withdrawal symptoms can peak. And you can then be at risk of the more serious symptoms, like uh, possibly even seizures and hallucinations. Um, But this is when, you know, that dangerous condition, delirium tremens may develop for those who've been heavily dependent on alcohol and have now tried to stop between 36 and 72 hours. The good news about all of this is that should really be about your peak. That Monday, Tuesday after a heavy Saturday should probably be the worst that you're likely to feel. And although that doesn't feel particularly comforting at the time, it's worth taking away that message. Um, In fact, when I remember... Uh, posting on an online thing when I was giving up getting to day three for the billionth time and somebody put a comment like an old timer somebody who'd been sober for years and went ah 
day three has a special place in hell. And I just remember thinking... <laughs> yes, I love it that. Does. It does, because that's exactly how it feels. You know, the happy, joyful memories of being drunk on the Saturday night are long gone. Next Saturday's miles away, and you're stuck in this horrific limbo with no immediate comfort. So you can feel very vulnerable and just very hopeless at that point. Um, depending who, you know, it can affect everybody very differently. But again, now we begin to see some of the benefits. You're looking at days three to 10. So by about Wednesday through to the following Wednesday. That's when a lot of your physical withdrawal symptoms can continue, but should just begin to subside slightly. And uh, what it's saying here is that they'll disappear one by one. So you might still have cravings, you might still have triggers, you might still even have mood changes. But that mental low should begin to sort of just ease off slightly um, as you're beginning to get past that one week problem. Of course, as you and I know, that's danger zone where you think, well, I'm fine now, so I'll just have another drink. But if you're able to then get into the start of week two, that's when withdrawal symptoms really begin to fade and the benefits of sobriety just become sort of knocking on the door and giving you that clearer thinking with your focus shifting from just withdrawing to maybe the bigger picture of life without alcohol in it potentially two to three weeks you're looking at a lot clearer now and potentially some people can start feeling excitement at this stage of thinking do you know what I've done this I'm doing this for myself and I feel good I'm happy that I'm gifting myself this and it's around this point as you're approaching maybe the three weeks stage that some of the research I've looked at says you're looking at identifying your habits and your triggers and that can make you feel quite empowered when you start thinking huh it's not that I'm really craving a drink, it's just that I usually always have a drink at this time, at that person's house, or in this particular setting. And once you're able to sort of identify some of those uh, habits and triggers, that's when, you know, some of those cravings should be coming less. And at this stage, sleep becoming more actually restful. And it says here you may begin losing weight, but not in my case, as we've discovered. <laughs> you know, I remember a very particular point around that stage, actually around one month uh, of driving. I was on my own. I came back to my house. I had a lot of building work going on in my property. It was the peak of a hot summer in the Mediterranean. And I remember just pulling into the garage and buying a family-sized block of chocolate. And I drove home. I parked up and I sat outside my house in the car. And I just ate the entire family-sized <laughs> And I was easy at thinking, I'm out of control, I don't know what I'm doing. And actually, Ruth, it was comparable to heavy drinking, like binge drinking. So yeah. I thought, I'm not really in control and I don't know why I'm putting this in my mouth, but it feels like I have to and I'm coping. And I remember just feeling really conflicted with those emotions, thinking this can't be good for me. But I knew that it was better for me than neat vodka or, you know, very strong gin. So, you know, sweetness cravings, I think, is another whole topic on its own. But I think they can linger for much longer. It'd be nice to think they're just for a few weeks after having given up. But one month and beyond, sugar cravings can be a very real thing. And I think it is your body's way of coping and reaching for a hit. Give me the good stuff. Make me feel a dopamine, you know, zing. I'm after something. And I think, you know, that can catch people off guard. But that it is also very, very normal. Uh, did you have an increase in sugar cravings, Ruth, when you gave up? Oh, it's really difficult to answer, really, because I've always had a sweet tooth. Always, like I'm actually known as a bit of a chocoholic. I, I do limit myself. Um, you know, I, I probably have chocolate every day, and a biscuit, and possibly a piece of cake. Um, I did see a slight increase when I gave up drinking, admittedly, but I wouldn't say an increase to where I thought it was a problem because I've always really enjoyed. My, my treats and my diet is so healthy other than that you know I, I do eat well but I had your cravings yeah. then <laughs> yeah your, yeah I took those for but you there's a, a really close relative of mine who gave up just over a year ago now and he said that he's never eaten as much chocolate as he does right now and I think he's found it really challenging to cut back on sugar but I think what you've got to remember, and I remember saying this to you, Jane, be kind to yourself in those early days that your priority, see it as one aim, one goal, is to not drink, to not put poison in your body. Yes, temporarily you might be replacing it with what you perceive as another addiction, but one one step at a time. If your body needs a little bit of extra sugar initially, go with it. Um, I think for me, 
it's probably healthier to try and find other outlets, um, possibly exercise. I know we've touched upon your little jigsaw um, mm. <laughs> new to, habit. I'm up to 67 <laughs> now, by the way. <laughs> Tell me you're sober without telling me you're sober. I've got 67 jigsaws in my loft. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that too. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of the positives, you've just mentioned obviously sleeping better and some of our listeners may have heard about the idea of a pink cloud and it's just the most euphoric feeling to wake up in a morning especially if it's a saturday morning or a sunday morning just even get a bigger buzz and just wake up and think i'm awake and i'm alert and i feel fit and healthy i'm i'm not recovering and that feeling alone is just amazing do you know that ties really nicely into the next bit I've got on here where we're up to the sort of two to three month period now so although you may still be uh, munching through sugar cravings and disappointed that they're lingering the good news is that around three months on that timeline of having given up drinking you're most likely to have regained most of your energy back suddenly those impossibly long days and I used to have to nap Um, nearly every evening Ruth and suddenly you don't need to nap as often you think wow because I've become a bit more of a superhuman energy levels can increase you're able to enjoy more focus and relationships may improve as you become perhaps less snappy more honest more present kinder and less selfish so relationships around you just perhaps begin to feel easier warmer and that sense of freedom from alcohol can kick in which i think is exactly as you say pink cloud i'm doing it it's like someone's taken the stabilizers off your bike and pushed you and your bike hasn't fallen over you think oh my god i'm gripping these handlebars i don't know where i'm going on this sober bicycle but it's staying upright and i can live a life without drinking i actually can make this happen and that's what's saying here around that three month period you're starting to think do you know what I really, I really can take this forward, and um, and it's that emotional side that can really kick in there and start making you look at your identity, perhaps, as a person who doesn't drink. Yeah, I think with the relationships, what I want people to sort of also be aware of is some relationships are going to absolutely be sort of accelerated when you become sober. I mean, my relationship with my daughters. I would say did change for the better because I had more patience. I wasn't trying to recover every weekend. I had more patience to play with them and listen to them and put them to bed, even if they've got up five times because they still need a wee. Um, (laughs) But also be prepared. There are some relationships that may be a bit more challenging. People who you perceive to be very, very close friends and good friends, but actually when you give up alcohol that friendship does kind of drift away and you might feel a little bit of rejection and a bit confused about why that friend is ignoring you or not coming out with you or treating you differently but be strong in your own sobriety because you know that is going to be more important you need to protect that in those early months over trying to win back that friendship just focus on yourself yeah Like you said before, though, that sense of euphoria, that sense of, I can do this, I'm starting to know who I am, and I'm okay with things changing around me, because I can do this as a sober person. I just think that, as you say, that pink cloud, that real realisation that there is a life that can be lived without alcohol, that you've survived several weekends in a row without drinking... It just gives you such an enormous relief. And when you said about parenting, I would say that's 100% one of the biggest benefits that I've experienced, Ruth. And it took me a while to see it, but it's just that I'm present. I know that when my kid comes to me at any point in the clock, they will get one version of me. If they're going Mm. around to a friend's house or they're at a sleepover and there were to be an emergency or somebody needs me, I will always be dependable. I will always, always be present. They will never have to wonder if I'm capable of driving, what mood I'm going to be in, will I remember it tomorrow, will I say something silly. For me, that's been one of the biggest, biggest benefits that you do start to feel in those early months that, hang on, I'm becoming really, really solid and dependable. And again, just as we mentioned before, in your own identity, and this is really exciting, I think. It leads on to, on this timeline, six months and we'll stop at a year by the way six months you should have adapted to a sober lifestyle and be able to recognize triggers yes to be able to go hang on a minute why do i feel this way oh it's because of x y and z oh i think i'm craving a drink except i'm not i'm actually just really thirsty and a bit stressed 
So at this point of being able to actually identify triggers, it's like spotting a booby trap, isn't it? Going, not today. Oh, no, you don't. And sidestepping it with all the tools and support that you've begun to build up for yourself. And that can just leave you feeling more in control, increasing your self-confidence. I like myself for the first time in years. And your your success at this stage begins to really help you realise that things are achievable. And, you know, this really does help you power forwards it really really does this Um, was a huge thing for me recognizing triggers and I've mentioned this in a previous podcast where I said you know some triggers for some people might be a certain venue it could be a certain person or friendship groups a, a, a companion who you always have a drink with um and do you know what Jane so I've been I haven't had a drink for three years and two months now and I went away recently with my husband, really beautiful hotel. We ordered a gorgeous plate of food. We both had venison and he ordered a glass of red wine. Didn't bat an eyelid. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. The red wine came and she poured it in front of him. And it was that whole marketing romance of red wine and venison. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's uncomfortable. (laughs) Where have you come from? And I I was like literally looking at my body thinking, I need to bat that away. Where has that ricochet come from? Yeah. And I, do you know what I did? And I wouldn't recommend it because it was, for some people it will be even more of a trigger. But I asked him, I said, can I smell it? And he looked Mm. at me as if to say, huh <laughs> what are you doing why do you want to torture yourself but for me it's not torturing yeah, is it because I'm, I'm over it I smelt it and to me it was like paint stripper and that's oh. what I needed I needed to remind myself that oh god that's quite pungent yep I don't need that in my body and there was um a couple of sisters obviously on a weekend away as well next to me they were also they spent ages over the menu looking at the bottles of wine and whatnot and they ordered this beautiful bottle i got up the next day in this gorgeous hotel i went down to the gym i was on the cross trainer i was doing weights and the two sisters walked in and did a run and i looked at them i thought well that's unfair how have they managed to get up and work out when they drank the last night and i had to remind myself i had to say actually they've done a run on the treadmill but I bet it's killed them I bet they felt like absolute crap because their body's trying to recover at the same time as pursue and outlet all this energy when they're recovering um so triggers definitely one to be aware of and I'd I'd say once you identify them sort of build up a little bit of a mental note of them and try and think of ways of how to overcome them and be sort of preempted and be prepared for them. But isn't it nice that you get quicker and faster at just spotting them? You think instead of thinking, oh, I'm Definitely. craving, I'm craving, I really want this, you go, huh, I feel as though I'm craving, but I'm not. It's because of X, Y, and Z, and therefore I'm going to do this and this, that, and the other. And you become really, really fast at spotting it, a bit like a, a naughty toddler with their tantrum building. You can see where mm. it's coming. You can tell it's because it's nearly dinner time. And you're able to just um, recognize it much faster and take preventative action, sidestep it, and move on. And those tools only come with you know, continued periods of sobriety. And again, boosts your confidence and your self-belief that, huh, I am in control of myself. I am not at a whim and at the mercy of the slightest apparent craving that might come out of the blue. And, you know, you do get triggers that might make you feel as though you want something, but you do also feel that empowerment of being able to challenge it, pick it apart, open it up into daylight, speak it out loud if need be, and unpack it that way and actually that does just bring me back to what I was going to tell you about this six month point as well I bought myself a little simple ring I was at an airport about my six month uh, period and I wanted just to buy myself a simple ring as a gesture that I've done half a year I can't believe I've done it and at the same time I went to the bookshop at this airport and I bought that Matthew Perry book that had just recently come out and I remember going sitting down, sitting next to my husband, and and he's like, oh, what have you bought? And I think it was the first time I was able to vocalise that I'd bought something to do with sobriety. And I was like, well, I bought this ring, so I want to mark that, oh, by the way, did you know, it's like six months now since I had a drink. And I thought, God, I can't believe I'm actually saying that out loud. I'm <laughs> making it real to the person closest to me. And he said, oh, what's that book you bought? I said, what's that new Matthew Perry one? It t- you know, it's about addiction. I thought that'd be a really interesting read. And I just thought, wow, this is the first time I have felt comfortable vocalising 
sobriety and not hiding from it or tiptoeing around it or being embarrassed about it. And I thought, that's interesting. It's around the six-month mark that I'm okay to actually say the word sober and sobriety out loud without feeling like it's a bit of a dirty taboo swear word and that I found was really interesting around that six month mark yeah and I think moving forward with that and we've done a session on vocab haven't we but I really like the idea of saying alcohol free or living my life without alcohol I think it just has more of a positive ring because I think as soon as you use the word I am sober people look at you with pity presuming that you've had this horrific background and that you've been a secret closet alcoholic who's hit rock bottom when that isn't the case at all so uh, yeah I think moving forward I'm hoping to see quite a positive change in the use of sober vocab yeah the language around it for me I remember thinking that's the first time I'm not embarrassed to use those words out loud and that really felt like a big deal um and taking it up to that one year point you know I've spoken to you before at one year I felt ready to to put it on my social media um it's saying here you should notice even greater improvements in your health your mood your overall well-being a reason for celebration you recognize the progress and the process relationship with alcohol will begin to become more of a distant memory of something of your past rather than an ongoing and a present struggle and it is nice to be able to start seeing it as something I used to drink somebody I used to be for example and to be able to be kind I am always quite quite kind to my old me you know really I'm I'm quite forgiving of who I was when I was drinking because I just didn't really know any better and I was trying as best I could to cope and I thought I was doing all right and I was trying to, you know, live up to all sorts. So I'm, when I look back at myself, I can be fairly kind about myself, even when I was drinking. And, you know, not everybody can feel that way, but it's good to make peace, isn't it? And to not drag yourself over the coals and to go round and round in circles. But it's nice to be able to look at that as a past chapter that is not part of your day-to-day life, so to speak, the actual drinking, you know? Absolutely. Do you know what? we perhaps need to sketch out like they do with the whole pregnancy journey perhaps that should be on our list to actually sketch out the alcohol free journey i love that yeah yeah the alcohol free journey for me reaching one year honest to goodness and very much like when you have a child when they reach their first birthday it can feel really emotional because you think oh you know with the with the drinking side i've done my first Mother's Day, I've been through my first New Year's Eve, I got through yeah. a first Christmas, I went to some people perhaps a funeral or a wedding. There are so many firsts that are encountered within that one year that reaching the one year milestone I truly believe is real cause for celebration because I just think there's something very circular, very, you know, what goes around comes around. You, you've completed a cycle of the seasons of a whole calendar year and proved to yourself that not on one day through those 365 have you had to resort to alcohol because you are in control and you have shown yourself that you're in control and you've done that by showing up every single day and dealing with your triggers, working on your relationships, improving your health and moving forwards. And it, it's just such an absolute delight to be able to experience I feel now Ruth perhaps I I gabbled through a little bit of the early ones now I'm sort of looking back thinking oh I wish I'd I wish we'd gone a little slower on some of those earlier benefits Um, but like you said I do like this idea of really focusing on the alcohol free journey like a sort of snake to some ladders game or you know something very very meaningful very different to each individual person but I love looking at the positives you know I'm not one for beating up and negativity and scaring and dooms and glooms but I I loved when I heard that smoking advert and when that pregnancy journey happened I do love looking at ha so now I've managed to go 23 days without alcohol you know this must be the state of my liver these are the benefits to my blood glucose levels or whatever you know and I'm not a scientist so I can't go into the nth degree and I won't ever try to but I I find there's a lot to be gained from focusing on the positive and I would want to really hammer that message home as well it's okay to feel excited it's okay to feel positive and optimistic about the future and to recognize each of those benefits as they begin sliding into life every single day that you manage to say no to alcohol 
Right, Jane, I've got homework for you then because my head is exploding with this. I'm going to paint the idea, oh. but I genuinely am thinking we need to, or you're more of the artist, aren't you? Sketch out a storyboard timeline with said dates on and which benefits are associated with said dates. Could you imagine this? I mean, normally when people are pregnant, they'll hold a little card up saying, I'm one week old, I'm the size of whatever. Yeah. And they take pictures. Could you imagine the sober community taking a picture of their running trainers at week three because they've been out for their first run on a Sunday morning at half past seven and then, you know, a six month picture of them on holiday with a mocktail by the swimming pool. Like, I think... That would be amazing if we can get some sobriety cards made yeah. where we can sort of explode on social media and people post them. I love that. Well, I think I said to you the other day, a contact of mine, an acquaintance on Facebook, posted an early morning sunrise walk with their dog at like 6.30. And I was like... They did! That is a yeah. sobriety photo. And I... And I we I, need a fizz free <laughs> sketched out, <laughs> positive point at this point you know time know. we need to get some of I the love science that. some of the science stats in there as well you know like you say mm. like day 25 at this point like you said with the pregnancy journey thing it says baby is now yeah. the size of a banana eyesight is beginning to develop baby responds to like loud noises and you think gosh wow that's exciting and as you said illustrations there and just wanting to know how is it for other people and let's face it if you're listening to this podcast that's exactly what you want to know how is it for other people yeah. how have other people done this and as I say, I'm just such a massive advocate for focusing on the positives. And if you've completed another alcohol-free day, that is a reason to celebrate. Um, and we'll also get our paints and pens out and try and do something arty. <laughs> now yeah, I've got free project two. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks for listening to Fizz Free. Find us online on Facebook, YouTube, on X and Instagram, as well as most major streaming platforms. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, the email is fizzfree0 the number zero at gmail.com. Don't forget to rate us and to give us a like and a share to spread the word. Changing your relationship with alcohol. Less fizz, more free.